Book Group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. Chapter 8, 30th of June 2012. Wondai, Queensland, Australia. <laughs> G'day, everyone. How are you all? Okay? Yeah. Going okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to be back having a, a fleeting book group before we go on the next adventure. <laughs> it is lovely, isn't it? Nicer out there than it is in here. Yeah. If we could do it out there, I'd love that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome to chapter eight. Hope blossoms into promise. Um, before we start on chapter eight, for those of you who might have watched chapter seven on YouTube, was there any outstanding questions you had on chapter seven? Barbara? It's more of a comment than a question. Yep. Um, I found it, um, I didn't see it on YouTube, sorry, okay, um, but I found it very um, emotional when he um, finished off the chapter. And I don't know if that was discussed last week when he said, um, um, the door of hope before me and now that he was gone, I could see door, the door still ajar. Yeah. yeah so I so was what was his hope? What was his hope from the last chapter? Because the, the last was, the, last, the name of the last chapter was the door of hope ajar and this one is hope blossoms into promise. What's the hope? Yeah, go Lizzie. Yeah. That he can actually take the messages from spirit world to earth. Yeah, yeah. Which is what is the whole chapter is about. And yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I agree, Barb. It was, it's very beautiful what he says, isn't it? He's, he's so um, emotive in the way he describes his desires. You know, we can feel... And we talked a lot in the last chapter down in Kyabra. We had a good discussion about desire and uh, allowing our emotions around desire, allowing desire to be in its fullness inside of us. And Fred models that beautifully for us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anything else on Chapter 7 before we just launch right in? <laughs> if we go to Alan and then to Graham. Um, I was pretty much taken by the fact when, um, I think it's Mayan when he said that, spoke two words, uh, my brother. Uh, just, just this real warm feeling came over me about what did that really mean and I had to read it several times. It's like there's a music in his voice and there's a huge narrative after that about just those two words, what they meant to him. Yeah, and yeah. It's, to me that's ringing through that whole chapter, those yeah. two words. It's just so beautiful. Very yeah. beautiful, yeah. yeah. We talked a bit about that down in Cobra as well. If you just pass forward to Graham. Um, I really got off on the, every man is held responsible for the, right, the full and right use of the intelligence with which he is endowed. Yeah. Because like all my life I've looked at the way people do things and it just seems like they're not thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and you like the fact that they're going to be held responsible for that. <laughs> well, I... It was supposed to be more about... Um, I'm just teasing you, Graham. Feel, feel, feeling that hard. I was doing the right thing after all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a bit of that feeling in there, though, isn't there? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah look, and I don't want to go through a whole big discussion of Chapter 7 because we, we should focus on Chapter 8, but, yeah, lovely to hear your, your feelings about it. <laughs> Lots of truth in that chapter, yeah. Okay. All right, let's uh, launch into chapter 8. Who can, who can tell me what happens at the beginning of chapter 8? What's going on? Joy? I've got the mic, so that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> the beginning of chapter 8 is the realisation that, that um, it's over and everyone's just left very orderly and... Um, there's no, none of the usual hustle and bustle that we usually have here after meetings and whatever. And so what's just finished? The, um, 
The chorale. The chorale. Yeah. 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 The whole chorale's finished. And it was just a, such a huge, well, production. I mean, it's such a huge thing. But it, it just ended as simply as it started. Mm-hmm. People just came together and they did what they came for and then they just all left. And, um, and the most amazing thing he said was that um, in all the time that he'd been speaking with these three people, Siamides and Mahanin and Kushna, n- no one had tried to interrupt their communion. Nobody had... No, there was no line of people waiting to talk to them or... Yep. Um, and he just was just amazed that it just ended so simply. Yeah. And that nobody had any... Nobody had any need, I suppose, to see other people or talk to other people or... Um so why did it happen like that? <clears throat> well, I've reflected on this a lot, you know, as I, as I mentioned to you, because of what I notice happens when we have events. <clears throat> um <clears throat> so what do you notice happens when we have events? Well, when we have events, I was really thinking about this. We come together always with a loving purpose whether it's a book group or a talk or, or whatever. And I kind of... Do we all come with a loving person? Well, there, there's the opportunity for us all to come together in a loving person. I think that's yeah. the opportunity we've, we've created. Sure, sure. Or that's created by you and um, AJ. Um, and I think that... Um, and at the end of the event, well, there's the opportunity to be loving because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I thought a lot about, even in my whole life, like... Okay, so it's a loving purpose to stay and clean up and help and whatever. But is there a loving purpose in just staying and talking to people? And is there, you know, if there's not a loving purpose there, why do we do that? Mm. Well, is there a loving purpose to stay and talk to people? It's a good question for everyone. What do you guys think? Deidre? Thank you, Joy. Oh, hi, Mary. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I just noticed for myself, because I noticed that, when I hang back, it's more because I feel like I don't have any friends, I feel disconnected, and I'm desperately trying to find my place, yep. see, and I feel like I don't belong. So by me hanging around, I'm like, hang on, I'm just trying to find someone that will buy into my addictions. hmm and that's not loving. So in this, they were like they had no addictions because they said there was no fear of not seeing someone again because they yep. knew they could see them or speak to them at an instant that they desired to do so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Anyone else have any other thoughts on that? Suzanne? When I reflected on that, my feeling was that it must be really beautiful to be in the spirit world and know so many things that we're not assured of here. What do you mean about um, being seeing each other again? You um, just the whole thing of, I think, of eternal life and knowing that you have all the time in the world probably removes a lot of that angst to see people again. I just yeah. feel like, even since I've known about it, I, I can reflect on going to bed every night and laying in bed and thinking oh god another day's gone wow. kind of thing yep. you know and what did I get out of today and you yep. know what's it all about and I don't have all the answers yet and since being part of this and coming to understand and reading the pageant messages and this and coming to see the fullness of life eternal mm-hmm. just something unwound inside me and that's now everything so much more it's like, it's okay. Another day went by and boy, it was another day. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah, mm. like my soul's eternal. Yeah. God's loving me. And it's I'm, just, yeah. it's changed so many yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. D- the, the fears are still there, but they're different. Mm. They're probably the deeper ones. But yep. So you feel like often we've sought out other people's company out of um, just a feeling like, oh, I need yeah. to, what if this is the last time we meet? And yeah. yeah. Or, or, or well, I, you know, I, I'm aware that I'm a fe- fearful person. So, <laughs> yeah. when it comes to fear, you know, I've had a lot to look at, and yeah, and I just feel that it's that. It's like that emptiness needing to be filled all the time because you feel lost, you feel alone, mm. you don't know the answers to life, you're not sure about God. There's so many things that we yep. all live with, but now, on this path, it all starts to be answered. And this, yeah. yeah, and yet. We do hang around a lot, don't we, and talk to each other. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 If you pass next to you, Tarad. Uh, just reflecting on that, um, I realise that when I stay around at the end or start talking to people, even in the breaks, it's because I'm trying to um, 
actually get a measure of where I am and what I'm doing from where other people are. Yep. So it's like it's a benchmark for me, you know, what's yep. happening for people. And it just says in here, no one individual had positively anything else to do but go. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, I, I never have that sense. I always feel I need to say hello to somebody or frequently I'm trying to find out something so yeah well, I, I need, need to get something it's a good point you raise mm. which is actually about fear isn't it yeah, totally. where am I at someone yeah. give me reassurance like or mm. and often uh, if I share my experience it's more real or if I you know if I hear someone else's experience then I you know reflect on myself or maybe I start comparing myself and I have to have another conversation and yeah Mm. We start to see, don't we, there's a lot of addiction that goes on. Yeah. So at yeah. five o'clock tonight, this place will be empty. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> if we go across to Jennifer. I think one of the big differences between here and the spirit world is we don't have a lot to tell us, to reflect back to us about our condition. I disagree. Well, uh, actually, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of, um, you know, like how in the spirit world you can look at yourself and yep. you can see immediately things that are shifting and changing. And here we've got, yeah, the law of attraction and, and all God's works, you know, showing us And our physical things. health. And, yeah, but they're not as immediate. And it just feels like in the spirit world um, there wouldn't be any need to interact, like, like you're saying, after the event, um, because, the, the, like Raja was saying, that's one of the, the needs that I think I have, too, is a yeah. need for immediate reflection. And But if you think about that, Jennifer, if we're coming together out of a sense of addiction... Yes, I agree need, that it's an addiction. ...are we really going to get a clear picture of where we're at? Right. Yeah. I'm just re re reflecting that that's, you know, something that I'm wanting yeah. to get. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely an addiction. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. If we go, if we go across to Glenda from from Jennifer, I feel that there's both. Like I've certainly seen myself the neediness to want to belong or want to connect to somebody. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with socialisation. <laughs> Isn't it just like with friends? Well, this is a good question. Let's talk about what is what is loving socialisation. Uh, yeah, Alan. <laughs> and then... When I was young, I used to think it was the 60s, where <laughs> we could swing in, all get together, you know, and everything's for free, you know, yeah, yeah. including love. Yeah. Um, but now, well, on the natural love path, I knew that was an error. Mm -hmm. But now, just listening to Raj talk before, I was feeling that if we don't trust God, then we're going to look for something else in replacement... Absolutely. And socialisation seems to be the highest point for human contact to get that something else that's missing in our soul. Yeah. yeah. So given that, what, you know, obviously then there's an error in our socialisation, yeah. isn't there? If we're using it in place of God. Yeah. So given that, is there a loving place for being social? If we go back to Jen. Jennifer. I have a feeling in my heart that love seeks to share has a form of demonstration and that somehow um, it's love in action. It's not just a, a feeling of, well, I've got it now. It's a feeling of um, sharing and giving and, um, yeah, Yep, I agree. Joining and so generosity. And does everyone else feel that there's some form of joining and generosity and sharing in love? Yeah. Okay, so let's keep going with this. What would be lovingly social? And in fact, what does through the mist show us? What's just happened? Lily? I haven't got much of a voice today again. Um, <laughs> um, it's about desire. It's about trusting that if you follow your desires, then you'll come together and be with people automatically. 
Yeah, and, and what, would, what would happen in that time that you were together? <laughs> okay, someone else. If we... Uh, yeah. No, no, if you go across, yep, and then we'll go back. Truth. Truth, yeah. With each other. Yeah, what else if we go back to Ant? Uh, your true desires in harmony with truth and love will be recognised or will be um, fulfilled. Yeah, so what, does, what would that look like? Um, like as an example? Well, in the, in the book where Frederick desires to speak with Mayaneen mm -hmm. and... Um, that being a true desire, a desire of his soul that is in harmony with the, the universe and the laws, th then that occurs. Yep. Yeah. And so the same would happen for all of us. Yes. Yeah. And what was, when you said it's in harmony with truth and love, what is, what is absent then? Addiction. Addiction. Yeah. 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 And what about this big event that just occurred? Was that an example of socialisation? Yeah. <laughs> no? Yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, not in addiction, <laughs> in truth. And so what, what, what did we see evidenced in the corral in terms of how people interacted? If we go to the back here, yeah. Um, hi, Mary. One of hi. the things that really struck me with that, uh, the leaving, exiting from the corral was that there seemed to be no sense of missing out from it by anybody and everything was driven by love and a mutual respect. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, wow, imagine, imagine if every time we got together, everyone felt that, that same way, that I'm not missing out on anything because I'm simply following my desires yeah. and everything that I desire will be given to me and having, having faith and trust, that that's really where we're heading. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, yeah. it was just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it is lovely. And you know... Um, Joy was speaking earlier about where it's loving when we come together to clean up and tidy up. Imagine if everyone came together in that state, though. How much would there be to clean up and tidy up? Nothing. Was there anyone there, like, mopping the floor? No, because everyone was there in this singular purpose with no addiction, uh, with a loving intent, and so they didn't create any, any mess or havoc anywhere either. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's something, what you say is right, Linda, like these people came together drawn by desire and they didn't have a need to validate it with Barb, share it with Graham, like talk to Renee and go, isn't this awesome? You know, they were just experiencing themselves and loving each other and it was very powerful and fulfilling for them, actually more fulfilling than if they had been going, what do you think? Do you, think? you don't think it's that good? Oh, I thought it was good. You know, all these kinds of things don't happen. Or where are you at? Oh, I'm not there yet. You know, just they all came together in this purpose. Okay, if we go to Jen and Barbara over here. Yeah. So in the Magnetic Corral, mm -hmm. um, each person who was there had a uniqueness about them that they contributed as just a, as a natural process. Yep. So my feeling from that is that inside of us we've all got a uniqueness that comes from God that when we share it naturally with those around us there's just upliftment and you know as we grow in love I mean yeah that uniqueness we get to recognize that for ourselves and then it just is a natural way to share and commune with others and... Yeah. yeah it's a gift feeling. you're offering, actually, the yeah. gift of yourself. And when yourself is in, in harmony with love, that's a big gift. Yeah. But you're not reliant on other people to give you things because you're involved in giving a gift. And you're not in reliant on other people in validating you giving the gift because it's a true gift. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lovely vision, hey? Barbara? I appreciated all of that and I reflected a lot on that. But the thing that hit me the most, because I'm so guilty of this, but the strange experience of all was that I held such a long converse with the three directors of that service without a single interruption or attempt to interfere with our communion. So I am so guilty 24-7 of interrupting people, um, pushing in, um, uh, wanting my time, you know, all of those things. Yep. And, um, and there it was in front of me. <laughs> and that they had that long conversation and not one person had a desire to interrupt them or had a need to say anything 
or express opinion or want to know what they were talking about or <laughs> yeah. wanting their addictions met or, or all of mummy, daddy, look at me, you know, yeah. any of those things. It yep. was just not happening and yep. I do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite beautiful, hey? That, And actually, if you contrast that to, say, what generally happens when anyone speaks, not just myself or AJ, what generally happens after someone finishes speaking? <laughs> Do you want to verbalise that action there? <laughs> if you pass back to Angela. I guess, you know, people tend to want some of what some more of what's been given mm-hmm. you know, they want more and, mm-hmm. um, that's and them. that's exactly it they want more don't they they they're not satisfied to receive or, and i see this happen a lot with people where they put up their hand go i've got three questions first question aj answers the question and i think well that's enough for, if that was me i'd be processing that for the next two months and they go okay thanks second question and you think that didn't even go in anywhere you know <laughs> And there's this feeling. What drives this feeling? I need more. I need more. Okay, I just got that. Well, that well, that's all good. But th- this is my example. You know, what is that? What's that? Is that love? What's going on, Sandra? I think I think it's fear. Just yeah. a lot of fear of how inadequate we feel and that we're missing out, as someone pointed out before, and that yeah. we can't learn on ourselves, relying on God, but we need everyone else to do that for us. Yeah. And it seems like you know, in the book. Uh, um, Fred is only interacting with anybody when he's learning. It seems like all of the interactions he has are for someone higher in, yeah, than his condition to teach him. Mm-hmm. And that is really what that so- social bit comes out as in the books, it feels like. Yeah, and we'll see other interactions as the book goes on, but certainly so far. And if you go back to what happened at the end of the chorale, the people who'd been orchestrating the chorale, what was anyone... Uh, flocking on them no everyone had their own purpose they were doing they weren't feeling needy no addiction this group of very loving individuals just got on with their day feeling fulfilled (laughs) and who did Mahanin go to who did the three of them go to Fred Fred (laughs) why did they go to Fred Sandra yeah just his desire his from the as you said from the um, chapter before, it's all about his desire and how quickly it gets met. And this is why, I guess, there was no interruptions because his desire was so pure to have these things clarified from these beautiful well, things. Is that the only reason why there was no interruptions? If we go across to Diana? Uh, no, just feeling like those three had such a desire to give to a loving purpose and even though the purpose of the chorale was over, um, they responded to that loving desire in Fred. Can you see something else here, though? That the people in the highest condition of love... Susan, do you want to say something? Suzanne, sorry. I was just going to say that it's almost like they already know about Fred. They know exactly how it needs to unfold, who needs to talk to him, where he needs to go next. It's all perfectly synchronised. How do they know? Because of their soul condition. Yeah. And the fact that there's that telepathic instant knowing amongst everybody of the perfect order. Yep. And, yep. The, and the higher souls seem to manage how things should happen next. So it's a perfect entry, exit. Yep. So yeah. It's amazing. Exactly. And this thing about the people in the highest condition seem to manage how things happen next. What does that demonstrate in everyone else, in the people around them? Humility. Humility. Deep humility. Definitely. Yeah. A respect for love. Totally, yeah. And that means that Kushna Siamides and Mayameen are all able to... They're in the highest condition of love and they're able to make the decision who, who is it most loving to speak to right now and they choose Fred. He's, he's this newcomer with these ideas. Mm. So can you see how kind of upside down the world is? <laughs> And the the example that we're getting shown, yeah, 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 cool. Uh, Jason, just enjoying the um, the feeling around how your desire mixes in with the law of attraction, yeah. and so they didn't have a, a law of attraction event where someone just popped in to ask him where the popcorn stand is, you, you know. <laughs> yeah, no. So I'm just enjoying the how your desires 
work in with law of attraction events yeah. and then everything works perfectly and, and how it is working perfectly yeah. in that and, space. And there's so much about desire. Like I feel these two chapters, I'm just on a real kick around desire lately because it really demonstrates so many lessons around desire, This, these last couple of chapters. Like the... You're right. They're not interrupted. But what else do we what else do we see about desire throughout this chapter? Because there's there's more that goes on around Fred's desire, isn't there? He first gets to speak to the guys. Then what else happens? We go to Deb. I heard from Deb. Uh, quite a few errors are corrected. Yeah, um, do you want to say? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, I've just got to read my notes here. Um, there's quite a bit about the... Um, sorry? No, I was, I was with Chapter 7 <laughs> <laughs> in my mind. Um, it, well, I've got that, you know, Krishna mentions that his chief area of work is with the children... Yeah, and his desire and pleasure, and then um, you know he teaches. That's right. He teaches us for not to ask so many questions at once. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about questions. What does he say to him about questions? Uh, yeah. You come across here. Sarah. Yep, Sarah. Just that there's so much time in order to get all of his questions met. Um, he still has this feeling that he needs to ask a million questions at once, but this this reality, this truth that time is indefinite and he's got all the time in the world. To get yeah, yep, he tells him that and he tells him something else that's important about questions. Uh, if we go to Raj again. Oh, if we go to Lorleen next and then we'll go across to Raj. Um, the questions, um, if you gave them enough time and you could hear them, it would lead to something else. And uh, the an If you just asked one question and yeah. waited for the answer. Yeah, yeah. and you would, you would feel them and you could take it to something else yeah I think the word patience came out quite often and the word gentle yes um, all connected with time yes um, yeah 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 who, who relates this to their own life <laughs> yeah I wanted to say Mary that I felt throughout the whole chapter that the word time and patience and gentle came forth mm -hmm. all the time and I reflected a lot because it had to do with um uh, questions which I tend to have a lot of and uh, needing to talk and all this and um, it it, uh, it was this uh, lack of trust that I feel that I wasn't going to get enough it's all to do with everything you know like not enough um, th that I won't get what I need because I'm not trusting the laws anyway and I'm not trusting God and I'm not trusting that this is just good enough as it is right now and allowing time to to absorb what you say soften mm -hmm. and um, you know like uh, allow but time doesn't let me because I'm in a hurry to know and do <laughs> well time lets you you don't let you I don't <laughs> let time yeah. yeah and that was what came through with the questioning why do I question so much and that was yeah you know um, so there's a fear driving yeah. it. There's not enough time. Yeah. I need to get all the answers. Oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? I need to know. I need to know. Yeah. And whereas Mahanin tells him something very different, doesn't he? Yeah. Brad, do you want to... Do you remember what you were going to say? Yeah. Um, I may be completely wrong here, but there seems to be some... This is a very interesting book because <laughs> there's so much depth to every... I every, agree. ...every aspect, every paragraph. Yeah. I felt that there was something in here about the questioning... Mm -hmm. And it's almost not so much about the questioner, but about the person delivering the message, because so much goes on to be about the teacher of truth. And I wonder if there's not a need um, for those at a higher level who are connected to a much greater source of understanding and awareness, and who are desiring to bring forward the truth impeccably, mm -hmm. that they need to connect to that greater source and draw from it rather than expressing their own opinion of where they're at about the answer. You, and this is where he talks about mediumship later on, isn't it? He, he talks 
Well, I'm not quite understanding your question, Raj. Oh, I'm just... I'm, I'm, uh, who's, who should tap into the higher source of knowledge? I'm just suggesting that maybe Kushner and Mahene and, and any of the uh, really aware teachers are tapping into a single consciousness to bring forward a common truth and a commonality. I have no idea if that's true. Uh, no, so but you could, you could answer this question, what are they tapping into? Well, they're What's tapping into their soul for, for awareness and the fullness of, of expressing... There's something the else that they've tapped. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> I'm not talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well then, it's uh, lovely that you're engaged, but... <laughs> um, well, maybe they're tapping into God. Well, they have. They're yeah. at one with God, so they've tapped into God. So maybe yep. that's where they're drawing the answers, which is why they want the questions one at a time, so that they can answer in the fullness. Ah, no, no. It's not, it's not about their limit of knowledge. It's not. No, it's about assisting the learner okay. to understand well. And so they, they have far more... They're not saying slow down because we need to transmit something. Right. They've already received love from God and have knowledge. Um, you guys who are laughing, that's very unkind. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> um, this, is, this is really good questioning that's going on here, yeah. Um, yeah, so they've already, they've already grown their soul and they have enough truth. But what they're trying to teach Fred is about slow down, you move too fast, you know, <laughs> that, the whole feeling groovy thing. Just, just relax and we're going we're gonna to help you learn without, you know, having to, you, your, your fear is driving something. And as they go on, they talk about the necessity to understand things well mm. if we're going to just, like, impart truth to the, to the spirit world. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm looking for hidden meanings. Yeah. <laughs> You can get like that with this book because there's so many. Yeah. Um, if we go to Jen. I reflected really deeply on this particular point and came to the realisation that when I personally string one question after another, I miss the depth to which the first question has been answered. Yes. And... In just asking one question um, and being nourished by the answer, then that allows me to go to a deeper depth, which is what I'm really seeking in the first place. Absolutely. And it's only fear or a desire to be heard that would drive us to ask another question. Mm. Yeah. 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 So what do you think about questions in general? So Mayanin's saying to, he's saying to Fred, okay, like he actually says on page 94, one question at a time is much better, is, a, is much the better method, especially here, where a very simple one frequently opens up a volume of information which we will always wish to convey as clearly and definitely as possible. And there's a big, so you all got that, hey? Like he's saying, yeah. But there's a big theme around questions in this whole book, isn't there? And my question for you is, how do we use questions? You've already identified some of the ways that you use them in error. But what, what is this issue with questions? What can drive us questioning? It can be this fear or what else can it be? Jane? Um, wanting to know the truth about yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. So, that so Fred's displaying this really deep, like, innocent deep desire. desire to, yeah. I want to know something. Yep. Yeah. And also to um, childlike as yes. well. Sometimes when you open yourself up to being a lot more childlike and being yourself, um, yeah, it allows you to to want to ask a lot of more, lot more questions because you start having a desire to want to know a lot more about things. So yeah. it's not questions are not always about being in addiction or yeah that, exactly that can be a, a yeah a pop, yeah being in harmony with love as well. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what's another way that we can use mm -hmm. questions, Deirdre? 
I actually did it in Sydney to AJ. Um, wanting to diffuse a situation, like trying to um, get in someone's good books or wanting approval yeah. or trying to diffuse anger or something. Yeah, know, by appealing to someone that has a desire to teach and I did that. Yeah. yeah. Lots of tricky ways we use our questions, isn't there? Yeah. I'm very guilty of that also. Like um, sometimes in a talk, if I have a feeling and that I think is truth, but I don't want to like own it, I'll ask a question. Or um, if I want to make a point, I'll ask a question. Now, is any of those things loving use of questions? No. No. There's one more loving use of questions. Barbara. Um, to gain knowledge. Yep, and so that's grow. what Jane oh. said. Yeah, what's okay. another way we might use questions? Go to Rob. Just behind you, Barbara. Yeah. Uh, it's a way of getting someone to really think deeply into the, and look into their own soul for the answer. Yeah. yeah, yep. Did you notice any that that's what I'm doing today? <laughs> and it's, it's a little bit strange for some of you. <laughs> I'm feeling that little, oh, hang on. But, yeah, I feel it's a, it's a way, if you think about when you really ask yourself a question, that's when you, you become most open to the answer, isn't it? Uh, if someone just presents the answer, pff, who cares, you know? Uh, and also, when someone's asking you a question in the process of your learning, it engages you immediately, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And later on in the, in the chapter, Mahanin actually asks Fred a question in answer to one of his questions. Which, which was to help him with a point as well. Yeah. All right, so let's keep talking about what's happening in the chapter. What else is happening, guys? We've seen all these people leave and they're all in this harmonious state. They're calm, they're trusting. And there's no facade in any of them, is there? They're not trying for addiction. They're not, there's no ifs inside of them. They have this surety, which is very beautiful. Um, okay. And now he begins to talk to Kushner and ask the question. And he is told just one at a time, Barbara. Um, the main thing that stood out to me on the questions was about, um, or the, the realisations, mm -hmm. was that um, he was so excited, Fred, that you could actually communicate from the spirit world to earth and the truth about that. Yes. And then his eagerness to do that, but then, okay, wait. <laughs> you need to grow and you need to know more truth before you can do that because yeah. of the error that's already occurring on earth because of that eagerness for people to go back and shed untruths. Yeah. Not knowingly sometime, they're just not giving the full picture, but then he does talk about also wretched or wicked people who are earthbound, who are... Um, um, not sharing truth, they're sharing... Well, he doesn't... Yeah, on purpose, they're yeah, sharing on purpose. error. Yeah, yeah, sharing yeah. error. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's rewind. Let's go to when he, Fred realises... Kush, his cushion has told him about the small boy that he passed over with and he realises that you can go back to Earth and, and he realises it's possible, this hope of his is possible. What, what do we... What do we know about Fred in, the, in that little paragraph? What's happening for him emotionally? Sandra? Oh, he's just, um, he's just buzzing. Because <laughs> he's just, he hel he's had this realisation within himself, obviously, but he doesn't trust himself that yes. this was possible. And for him, it's like, he's, I can just feel him, you know? He's this little child that's completely like, wow... I actually have felt this and he just wants to know whether that's true because he wants... Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. he's so excited about it. It's his passion, like, it's his number one passion that he's <laughs> yeah. so passionate it's about. It's his hope, isn't it? Yeah. His huge yeah. hope. And last week when we were in Kyabra, we talked about this experience of being humble to desire and everything that it triggers. So in the last chapter, we saw that Fred allowed this big desire that he had to speak to Mahanin to come up and he just let it overwhelm him and it... And, he, and then he let it trickle away and he thought it wasn't going to happen. But he just allowed himself to ride that huge wave of desire. And um, I think, Joy, you said, he seems so fearless. And I said, is he fearless or is he just willing to face fear? And here we see, again, 
this huge desire has come up, and, but now we, we get to hear some of his emotions. What are his emotions while well, he's waiting for the answer? He's, what, you mean this is possible? What goes on for him emotionally? Uh, Jane? Um, he actually says on page 95 that his heart's sort of tearing um, between sort of hope and fear. So yes. he's in that sort of in-between state. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. He's just like in this tortured state that yeah. Sandra was talking about. And he's, but he's being humble to it, isn't it? He's not like, Kushner, grab him by the collar. You've got to tell me now. <laughs> he's just like, oh my gosh, I can't bear the, the thought of this might not be possible. I want it so much. And he's just allowing all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very beautiful, his humility, yeah. All right, so what happens next? Inner? If the mic people, if you guys were actually in the middle, you'd probably, because there's not many people on the edges, you might save some time. Well, um, Fred get told all the, that he has to wait. He can't go back straight away because, like, he hasn't got all the answers quite yet. And he talks about how, um, well, how dangerous it is actually to go back and just, um, you know, when somebody has a certain error about something, to take out that error and then plant in a different error. Yes. So that, and a lot of people do that. So he was talking about how he has to acquire all the knowledge first and has to be trained to be able to go back and do that. So yeah, yeah. So what did what did it make you guys reflect on this part of the chapter? <laughs> uh, we got a joy. Um, my own personal experience of being three years on this path and thinking how much you know and wanting to share it with everybody, and then the realization that. Well, actually, it's probably more harmful than good if you're not really speaking the truth and how often also that misrepresents what Jesus and you teach us because we don't really understand it yet at a full emotional level. And in this, yeah. this soul-based understanding is, yeah. is going to be powerful. Otherwise, we're going to remove error and plant more error. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what that does is just turn people off. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. it, um, What's the word he uses? It creates a contradiction. Yeah, well, and he's speaking there specifically about communication between the spirit world and earth. And so he's, sa- he's, he's actually drawing, he's telling a truth about what's happened historically, hasn't he? Because there's been so much contradiction, because everyone's just making it up, um, then no, everyone begins to doubt the veracity of any of it, which is, is quite harmful, yeah. If you pass across to Geraldine, who had a... Um, It brought up for me um, a kind of addictive thing about uh, talking about things, having to tell someone. Um, And uh, a kind of addictive thing that I know I've experienced of um, not riding the full wave of my processing. Yes. But like, oh, I've discovered this amazing thing, I have to tell you. And um, or sharing um, some deep experience that I'm having before I've completely 100% um, processed it, yes. and that will dissipate my energy around it. I'll get someone's approval or their opinion or whatever, and it'll become a, more of a social experience rather than an individual, deep, private sort of um, experience just between myself and my soul and God. Or yeah. yeah, and and as you said, it takes energy away from it. It mitigates the the true soul experience, doesn't it? Why is that? Why does that happen, Sandra? Um, I feel it's an avoidance, like it's an avoidance of the actual feeling. So we have this desire to speak about it because we don't want to really feel its depth and the emotion behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. There's there's something that takes us out at that moment, isn't there? Yeah, yep. Uh, if we go to joy. Um, the minute that, or the second that we go to the mind to intellectualise something where it takes us out of the emotion. Yeah, but there's usually an emotion that draws us to the mind. Uh, oh, well, if we're in emotion. So yeah. I'm not really willing to go any deeper. I don't really want to. I'm not being humble enough. Really. Yeah, yeah. And what, can, what about this thing that Geraldine raised though, this, this desire to share it with someone else? What is, what is usually driving that? Jason? 
It's an unloving emotion to get someone else to understand you. And what would drive that feeling inside of you? Um, it's where you don't feel loved. So you're wanting someone else to love you and instead of healing yourself. You, you, you're trying to pull someone else into your experience to yep. do, it, do it for you. Yep, could be that. Oh, sorry, that's my earring. Ego warned me. Um, <laughs> yep, th- you're right. That can be one of the reasons. What's another reason we can do that? Well, do I, you, yeah? I don't exactly know, but I know for myself, and I've done it with Renee many times, that I've, I've been really triggered. Yep. And I've gone into the motion and I'm sort of like halfway through it and then I feel good enough to talk about it, but I'm obviously not. But it's actually projecting violence towards Renee as well. Yeah. I'm halfway through somewhere and then I end up creating more shit and then I have to go out again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, so I've made it harder for myself and I've created more unloving distance between yeah. the two yeah. of us. For sure, so. for sure. So what can drive us to do that in that moment, Barbara? For me, it's been competition, uh huh, um, comparing and competition um, and arrogance. Because yeah. as soon as you go into that position, you've stepped out of humility and you've gone into arrogance. Yep. Usually, that's how yep. I feel. So when you're when you're processing and then you suddenly want to go and tell someone else, what is what's the feeling? The feeling like I want to show that I've done something. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's then comparing then myself with somebody else who's probably shared that they've been able <laughs> yeah. to, you know. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, and all this sharing going on means that probably none of us actually got there. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, there's another reason I can think of why we might do that if we just go to Deirdre, yeah. Um, it's to like, to get like your own self-importance because you just feel like you're just not important. So it was like... Yep, which is kind of similar to similar, what Barbara said, yeah. yeah. and feeling like, because if I feel like I'm no one um, understands me, then the addiction is... I want to be understood, so I want to engage in someone to understand me type of thing. Yeah, so that's getting closer to what I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. So can anyone else along those lines? If we go to Inner. I think it's also a validation. Like when, when I've gone and processed something, then I want to tell somebody because I want them to tell me that You've processed that. That's good, you know. Yeah. So, um, so it's kind of a um, approval as well. Approval. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sandra. I think it's all once again based on fear. I feel like when I do that, I just really am afraid that I'm I haven't got it. Yeah. So I want someone to tell me that yes, I got it. Yeah. And, and yeah. It very often it's to say, if I just had this feeling on my own. Or maybe that's not really valid or whatever. If I tell someone else and they go, oh, I get you. Or, yeah, I've had that feeling. Then we go, phew, okay, yeah, I'm not alone. I'm not separate. I'm not all these other big fears. And also, like many times in our childhood, we were only allowed to have a certain feeling if everyone else agreed with it around us. So there's a lot of fear often that takes us out at that point and makes us want to share or talk to like someone else. It's like not trusting, hey? Like we don't trust ourselves at all in this process. We yeah. don't trust God that, yeah, this is, you know, this is what you've got to go through. Like, I don't have that trust and so I do this thing you're just talking about <laughs> do all the, the time. Do this thing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is, I suppose, what we're being shown about desire and emotion. Fred has just tumbled to these whole experiences, isn't it? He's not, he's not trying to validate it all. He's just like a sponge for information and then he's just his own little roller coaster going around just experiencing it all. And because of that, he's growing really rapidly. If you think about it, in eight chapters, what he's learned. And it's, it's only like, how many days is he in the spirit world? Very few. <laughs> like, he's, he's got there, he had a bit of a sleep, he went to the magnetic corral. Like, <laughs> you know, he's learnt a lot, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. All right, um, Joy? That just raises an interesting question, Mary, as to how willing we are or even have a belief that we can learn that quickly mm-hmm. and just being open to that. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, if you think about what a baby learns in the first six months of their life, that is massive. Or in the, between their first birthday and, you know, their 18 months, it is massive what a child is able to assimilate emotionally, phys- like physically, spir- 
if you start speaking different languages to a child, my gosh, they'll, they'll learn them like that. It's, it's only all the, the stuff we get about learning, isn't it? And the emotions we don't want to feel, our lack of humility that actually prevents our learning on any subject. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good, it's a good thing to think about, Joy. Yeah, yeah. All right, what else, what else happened here? Wow, I was so emotional about this chapter, guys. About this issue of mediumship that he talks to him about. What, those of you who are actively engaged in mediumship, did it bring up any reflections for you? I imagine most of you are engaged in trying to speak to your guides. Any ethical issues that are brought up for you as mediums? Jo- uh, Jane? Jane? Um, basically it brought up the fact that to be, you know, to actually engage in your mediumship is it takes a lot of responsibility um, being in that, that place and the responsibility that you hold in how much if you are channelling something, if, if it is untrue and the damage that you can cause to others and, not only, yeah, to yourself but also to others yeah. is like huge. Yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's really, <laughs> it just opened my eyes, yeah, a lot more the eyes about that of how much damage is being done at the moment with um, yeah, with just everybody not being in that place of, of humility and yep. not even willing to really look look at themselves yep. and self reflect really where they're at. Yes. So, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, um, Krishna says to him, um, uh, he says A very limited experience will convince you, this is at the bottom of page 97, will convince you that the great skill is required to uproot error successfully and plant the truth in its place. Competency for such work can only be acquired by careful training, diligent study and an extensive acquaintance with the laws and requirements of the spiritual life as you will see them unfolded here. Linda? One of my fears with mediumship is that I listen to one of those spirits who have not gone through that training and I suppose that um, it hinders my desire because I have fear about contacting. So why would you be afraid of that? That they would just replace one error with a different error and mm-hmm. that I would be telling or believing untruth. Um, so each time I try and contact my guides, I do pray that please give me someone who's wanting to speak truth or on the divine love path or someone who's... Yeah. Yeah, so I, I tend to combine the two. Yeah. If you think about it, though, if we were to apply the same rules to ourselves as mediums, as he suggested, because really, if you think about it, Fred wants to train to be a medium, doesn't he? He wants to speak to the other side. And we're here wanting to speak to the other side. And, and Kushner is saying to him, well, to do it well, you're going to have to be carefully trained, have diligent study, and understand the laws and understand spiritual life. Now, if we as mediums all took that on, that would be pretty good advice, wouldn't it? And actually, if someone came to us in a state of error, we'd have quite a few tools, wouldn't we, to discern where this person has come from. Yeah, yeah. He goes on to talk to Fred about some other things, um, some things that he's learned through trying to speak to people on earth. What, what does he, what happens? What's he told? Ange? Um, just from what I remember, um, he's told that, first of all, there's, there's a lot of difficulty Mm-hmm. Um, but the the the, um, the basically the law of rapport. He mm-hmm. doesn't call it that, but um, that is in action. Is in is in you know it's in action all the time. Yep. And so. Um, and can you explain the, l- the law of rapport for us? Uh, birds of a feather. <laughs> <laughs> um, simply. No, yeah. Um, and and how? Do, what does that mean? Well, he for calls spirit? it the the law of spiritual harmony and fitness. Yes. Kindred souls have mutual feelings, so both in the positive and in the negative. Yep. And um, the same law applies in the spirit world as it does here on earth. 
Um, so uh, he's saying that when, when I go to speak to someone on earth, m- my ability to do so is helped or hindered according to the level of rapport that's between the two of us. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it's either a, um, it's either a congenial environment for him or it's or he he's actually re, um repulsing no he's being hang on is he repulsed he's or repelled repug- that's right he's he's um his presence is repugnant to the to the spirit because of the creed the doctrine or or the beliefs that that person has yeah and he says some really interesting things doesn't he about mm, mm. creed and doctrine mm, yeah. which if you th- so again now if we apply what and just said what Kushner is telling this to Fred, how does this apply to us? It's pretty yeah. obvious, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, if, we, if we're not prepared to be open to the truth um, and, and desire that truth above and beyond everything else, then we're going to have a belief or a creed or something, you know, a viewpoint about ourselves particularly mm-hmm. that we're not going to want to give up. You know? Yeah. And so... And that's just going to limit... Yeah. 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 If we go to Jennifer as well, yeah, something. It just demonstrates to me how essential it is to improve our soul condition as a medium. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, I personally have not felt that I'm in good enough condition to do that because I can see all this stuff coming up and so I've just not even, you know, gone in that direction. But I can see maybe the the wisdom of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well <laughs> the the law of rapport and the law of attraction would be in action but it's interesting what you say about the the necessity to raise my soul condition now is that all it is really about is that all we have to do to do do good mediumship renee what do you <laughs> what else do we have to do or is that all? Is is that necessary? No, I just feel that um, it's a lot deeper than that. I just feel that there's way more of being of service to others. Um, it doesn't come back to what we can get out of it. It's definitely for we're here for others. It's you know, of course, to grow in love, to um, learn and listen and open our hearts for others. But I still feel it comes back to being of service to others. So there has to be a desire within us to serve, which is what Fred is like yeah. racing down the hallways of heaven going, could we please do it now? <laughs> so he's definitely got that in place, doesn't he? What else does he have? It's going to make him a very good medium. Jennifer? Um, it just seems really important that we actually have a strong desire for truth ourselves so that we can learn like, because his example of going to that group that was so enmeshed in the doctrine, it's like they're not willing to, to step out of that and, and seek greater truth. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what is that really? What is that when he says... Um, oh, sorry. Um, that's it. They were seeking and they found just what they sought for. This is when he's talking about them speaking with other spirits they they found just what they sought for not truth but a confirmation of their creed Mm. so what is that really what is that quality they're demonstrating Lorleen I've interpreted that as um, they'll only hear what they want to hear yeah which is a state of arrogance arrogance Yeah. yeah Yeah, so what would be the number one quality that would make us a good medium, whether we're in a high soul condition or not? Lily? Humility. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I feel like Kushner's giving him a lesson not just in... He's, he's talking about the level of humility Fred will need, but also the level of the lack of humility on earth and how that prevents truth growing there. Yeah. Renee? Yeah. I just wanted to say that, like, with the, the training and the diligence study, um, that when I read that, I, I was just so excited. I just, like, had a feeling of... Um, oh, I've lost it now. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just really connected... 
I feel like I'm not humble enough. I just want to be so much more humble to be able to um, learn and open to all these truths. And it's and we've been given like in one paragraph, we've been given a simple way to follow. And I'm like, yeah. there it is. Like we just follow that way. It's so simple. We can just you know, <laughs> hum, be humble and 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 learn God's laws and truths, and and you're on your way. You know. I yeah. Just, I just saw, saw that as such a simplistic. It is, isn't it? It's like a, it's like a um, building blocks to good mediumship that have nothing to do with spirit communication, but to do with qualities within our soul. That and that's the that's the key thing that AJ's been like trying to teach everyone for so long is the just the key concepts, the key principles, the key soul realizations that if you have them, they'll carry you into eternity of growth, you know. You don't need anything else. You don't need to know, is it a red colour for anger or a brown one, you know? Because there's a, there's a way of understanding everything if you just get the building blocks, blocks right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it was just so exciting. I was just like just over the moon in that one paragraph. Yeah, just, awesome. Mm. Yeah, and isn't it a beautiful way that Fred's being taught? He's being taught in that way, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> you need to give it to Joy. <laughs> oh, Alan, just, you want it? Yeah, yeah um, maybe the stall was <laughs> adequate because um, I just thought, I remember AJ saying that if we focus on those key soul gifts that are already within all of us, then we've. it seems like, we have it back to front in humanity. We like the metaphysical stuff that we've studied to try and get to understand the soul. Where he says, if you actually go for the soul first, yep. all those things will come to you. Yeah, it's so much easier, and God made it that way so it would yep. be simple. But we've gone reverse from yep. the error. Yeah. He's such a good designer, God, isn't he? Like he he's inbuilt in everything. This is one of my other latest things this week. I just keep getting like overwhelmed by how well God's designed everything. That okay, even if you tarry and go down this other strange route, He's built everything in there to like go. It's over here. It's over here. It's over here. But if you just walk down that way, then you kind of get an understanding of I everything. I know it's awesome. He's Isn't made it? giveaway signs instead of stop signs. Exactly. Like, love it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Renee, you want to say something else? I was, just, I was just thinking he's the Kelvin Klein of, of, in heaven. Kelvin Klein of like, heaven. Like I don't the, know. The designer. Of the designer, the yeah. Design <laughs> yeah. In heaven. <laughs> yeah. Nike. Nike. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think that might be cheapening God somewhat. But yeah. I think that oh, there's jaws dropping all over the the audience. Not Nike. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway, it's pretty good design. It surpasses any design on earth, I reckon. If we, but if we could learn to design in the way that God's designed... If, you, if we look at the, how much he's placed into everything for correction, for growth, um, yeah, it would be so, the world would be so different. Yeah. All right. What other lessons does Krishna teach Fred about mediumship or other points that really got to you guys about spirit communication? Sandra? The one thing that he keeps repeating, which really is so beautiful, is the. Um, it is far better to let the old era remain than to pluck it up only to plant a new one in its stead. Yeah. And that really just spoke to me because of what yeah. I've done in my life. In terms of different paths and different... <coughs> just do you mean? Um, feeling that I know something and then telling people that this is the way and then yeah. actually not even knowing the truth. Once again, coming back to that, you know, arrogance of wanting approval, that, yeah, or fear of not knowing... Or often it's because we want people to join us. Like, I'm doing oh, this yeah. new thing and you should know about this, so you'll come and do it with me. And, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of lack of humility, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask a question about Certainly. one thing that was um, that I really wanted to know was he was talking about the mists through the mist. Like, um, it's on page 97 up the top. Yeah. And it's about the, um, uh, you know... I think he's trying to say about emotional error, but I'm not sure, and that's what I wanted to ask. Sure. Um, you, yeah, you cannot understand the present, but um, this for present, but when an opportunity... Hang on, sorry. But when an opportunity arises for you to study the phenomenon, yeah. you will be able to appreciate what I say. So before that, he's talking about a curtain of mist, that's right, and a cloud being created um, mm -hmm. that 
prevents the rapport between celestial guides and us. Yeah. And I really wanted to know that's if that's what he's talking about and whether he's talking about the emotional condition we're really in and that he's not really explaining that yet to, um, to Fred. To Fred. Yeah. What do you guys think? What did anyone else think when they read that? Uh, yeah, Ange? I just had some sort of vague feeling that perhaps um, that's changing all the time. The, the thickness, the depth, the... The cloud. Um, the cloud, yeah. According to the uh, love that's being uh, manifested on the earth at the time or something similar to that? Yeah. I th and do you think he's referring to the whole cloud around the whole earth or around certain people? Suzanne? If you just wait for the mic. Go on. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot. That's all right. <laughs> I love that when you're so engaged, you just want to say. If it seems to me it couldn't be the whole Earth because there must be so many millions of different circumstances all evolving individually at any one time. So yep. it must be particular to the circumstance. Yeah. The, the degree of resistance or openness or love or fear or whatever is taking place yep. in the moment. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, if you go to Lorraine next. Um, I saw it as the cloud um, being denser, meaning... Uh, the transparency of the messages would be harder to feel for each person, depending on their soul condition. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think it's about the rapport that can be established. And I think he's referring, like the point that Suzanne raises, that you've all raised a, a right, I feel, it, it's when, if you, you can feel this in your own condition, can't you? When you're in a really heavy spot, resisting a lot of things, feeling angry, what do you think the atmosphere around you is like? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then at other times when you feel really connected and maybe you've had a big cry or had a big realisation, what does the air feel like around you? Yeah, and what usually happens at those times? You've received truth, you feel more connected, even just to the people around you, to yourself. So obviously then, you know... There's, there's going to, it's going to be easier to get through the cloud. If you're someone who's in a similar, who has a similar, what, what would have to be similar? So it's not just soul condition. What's the other thing that needs to be similar? Desire. desire. Yeah, yeah. So if I have a big desire for God, someone who also has that desire can connect to me really well. Just like if I have a big desire to avoid myself, someone who has a big desire to do the same way. So... So Kushner is talking about the cloud because he's, remember, at one with God. He's got to get through the cloud of like everyone's addictions and avoidance and all of that to try and find someone who ha might have a pure, a humble heart really and a, just a pure desire that he can then impart truth to. Yeah. So is that clear, Sandra? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. What else, guys? What else did he learn about mediumship? I think there's another point. Yep, Barbara. He explained um, um, to Frederick when he was trying to um, communicate back on Earth that um, 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 if there was no willingness or desire to um, um, know or feel his information or trust him, that he would always back off. You would never push forward. Yes. Yeah. So he's, I love, what does that, we know this about loving spirits, right? What are they going to respect? Your free will. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So he's really giving him a big summary, isn't he, of just all of the principles that are governing the the ability to communicate between the spirit world and earth. So he's talking about how, because he's loving, he's going to respect free will. When there's rapport, he can speak. When there's not, and when there's, then there's often not because there's arrogance within the group that are, that are joined there. So, Diana? The other thing too about that backing off was that there was still the openness in them for any opportunity to correct the error in that other the other person for the for the celestial spirits yeah too yeah, yeah they they don't sort of give up and go oh well you know, forget about that <laughs> yeah, person yeah. you know <laughs> they, they just go they're always in that openness of an opportunity in that person 
that yeah, they can. Yeah, and that's displaying this quality that keeps being brought up all through the chapter. What's the quality? Humility. Yep. And desire to serve. Yep. Mm. And another one that's being encouraged in Fred. Patience. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot of lessons in this chapter about how, you know, in Corinthians, how does the verse start? The description of love is it? Yeah, it's Corinthians. Love is love always is patient, patient and kind. And kind. And really, it's a. There's a lot of demonstration of that throughout this chapter, isn't there? And and the humility required for patience as well. You know, Fred has to be humble to a lot of things in order to just, okay, I'll listen to this. You know, I've got all this burning stuff inside me. I'll just feel it and and engage in just this questioning process with you, trusting you that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to learn. Yeah, yeah. All right. There's some beautiful things in here about truth that really moved me. Um, he's, Krishna says... Truth being powerful in pu- to pulling down of the strongholds of error. And I thought, wow, you know, just whatever truth is within me, <laughs> if I can grow truth within me, that is the most powerful thing to pull down the strongholds of error all around me. So I thought that was very beautiful. Barbara, yeah, do you want to take the mic and tell us where? Straight after that, um, Mary. Um, It must so continue until the gloom of ignorance is driven away and the peaceful and harmonious kingdom of God established upon the earth with a basis as firm as it is beholded here. I cried and cried every time I read that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful vision, isn't it? It sure is. I think I, I had to question myself why I got so emotional all the time about it and I don't think I believe it's true. You don't believe it's possible? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's good to connect to that feeling. You know, I know I've cried about that many times. This feeling of disillusion and that it's can't it can't possibly be good ever. You know, that's something that a lot of us have absorbed in our childhood. And ironically, it's actually one of the things that prevent it even happening because we're all wandering around disillusioned about the possibility. Yeah, so we never hold the hope, we never hold the vision, and it can never come to pass. Yeah. Yeah. What other things were brought up in this chapter for you guys? Uh, Yep, Ange, and then we'll go to Kel. Uh, Just the idea that, um, you know, all these other pathways that we were just talking about before, uh, they are finite. There will be an end to them, you know, whereas the truth is infinite. Yeah. Where does he talk? What page is Um, that on? I've got the printed copy. It's uh, bottom of... I can't even see. Yeah, 100, I think. 87. Bottom of it. I don't know what it is. On Might be page 100 of this version. Okay. Um, to the end of the chapter. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, men are now, now making the discovery that truth is infinite yeah. while creeds are finite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That as it is impossible to reduce the illimitable to a geographical atlas, so it is useless to endeavour to embrace the whole of truth in the most elastic confession of faith. Mm. Yeah, very beautiful. It's a bit like, um, you know, you'll be a fool for God. Well, I'll keep trying and I'll try this path and I'll try that path and I'll try, you know, <laughs> I know that somewhere yeah. I'm going to yeah. hit on the right one. And yeah, and and I thought that was beautiful the way Fred explained his burning desire to come back to earth is because he was seeking. He yes, knew there yes. was another truth yes. and he could never find it and if yes. he could just give that gift to someone. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there are so many still hungering for it. I mean, that's yeah. what really opened me up. Like how many people are still hungering yeah. for this truth, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel that too, Ange. And, um, and I just feel the gift that Fred has given us, us right here today, that, you know, it's a lasting gift, isn't it, that he, and he's expressed it in such a beautiful way in an engaging story that we can all, like, just explore these truths. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. Kelly? Just after that, um, around men are beginning to appreciate that natural food, which is prepared in heaven, and and whole, my whole life I've not acknowledged where everything is prepared and yeah. I just thought that was a beautiful um, description of how we create everything here and I've worked all my life 
you know, being self-reliant and yeah. not understanding what else is going on. Yeah, in us, yeah. You know, with God. Yep. But, yeah. And also that it's that's the true nourishment is this yes. this truth from heaven of the truth of the the universe. Yeah, yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, and he he ends the chapter very yeah. hopeful, doesn't he? Yeah. There's a lot of hope in there. And truth must conquer. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for that is the child which God surnamed om, omnip- omnipotent. omnipotent. But nature's maternal ad, admonition, ad, ad, admonition. admonitions. Do you Whatever ever have that where you read a word so many times <laughs> in your life, you know exactly what it means, and you go, "How do I say it out loud?" Admonitions, counsel it to perfect its victory in patience. There's that patience word again. Yeah, there's and a lot there. I feel such a surety when I read that. There's just such a a, a, a feeling of. That's it. Yeah. You know, it's so certain. Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? And mm. it's when – isn't it beautiful when someone like Krishna right now, he's he's talking about the strength of love and of God and of truth and you can feel it and you think, why was I ever afraid of like rivalry and jealousy and violence? When you feel the strength and power of love mm. – when from someone who has actually lived it when it's in their soul, it's quite inspiring for other souls, isn't it? And this is why I feel it's so uh, important for me to grow. If I want to help anyone else, it's my growth that's going to do that. It's not, like Sandra said, telling someone else about it. It's if I grow, people will be inspired to to know God if I know God. Yeah. Yeah. So it's beautiful what Krishna is, uh, is doing there. Yeah. Uh, Graham? Um, I found it pretty grounding where he says that the followers of truth are steadily multiplying into the tens. You know, like in the whole planet, there's only tens of people that are followers of truth. Yeah. You know, it really shows how much patience they've all got. That there's a whole yeah. planet of people here and there's only a few tens of us that are really followers of truth yeah and yet they're still in there yeah they're still helping us and they're still hopeful and they're They're, still hopeful they're like oh no it's definitely gonna happen yeah and it's gonna we'll we'll get there eventually yeah the amount of patience involved in that's incredible absolutely yeah i i feel that as well i found that very moving that they that such hope comes from just tens yeah. Yeah, and and like we it's so easy for us to get tempted into thinking it's all going to happen tomorrow yep because that's the way we want it in this world, don't we? So that we don't have to feel any insecurity or fear or any or any kind of doubt or anything. We just make it happen now, mm-hmm. and and really, that's not even humble. We haven't even mastered humility when we want it to happen like that. Yeah. So and these guys have been working at it for a couple of thousand years, and they've got <laughs> a few tens of people that are <laughs> yeah. followers of truth after yeah. a couple of thousand yeah. years of work. Yeah. You know, and they're ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very lovely. Um, yeah, if we go to yeah, uh, Barbara, then Linda, and then Luli. On from Graham because it, um, um, I like Graham's wit in there. <laughs> um, because they're still saying, and victory is at hand. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah. They, yeah. They, well, they know truth will conquer. Yeah. And there's no time frame to it. Yeah, yeah. it's beautiful. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Linda? One of the things that really struck me where he was when he says crumbs of spiritual bread are falling upon the earth. Mm-hmm. And and I realised that that's been happening like forever. Mm-hmm. But we miss because we're so close to it, we've missed out on so much. You know, and why has it taken so long for me to realise that, that God has always been giving us these messages? Yeah. You know, and it's like... Oh, I'm really grateful that I'm finally getting it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and maybe somewhere along the line that will be a benefit to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Lily. Um, I felt quite disillusioned by this. Yeah. Because, um, well, this was written 100 years ago and they're talking about the wondrous leaven and I'd like to know what that is. Because the which, sorry? The, the wondrous leaven that's resulted from the truth 
crumbs, and the spirit, all that stuff. Um, so you're like, where's the results a hundred yeah. years later? Yeah. yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 I was wondering, like, how has the world changed as a result? As a result of these things happening. Does anyone think the world's changed in a hundred years? Yeah. Uh, Jen? And if you pass back to Jason, Lulu. Um, the miracle that's occurred in having reincarnated beings having returned, you guys coming back, if that, if that in itself is... Well, I'm passionate about this, I can feel it coming. Um, if that in itself in a hundred years is the only thing that happens, then that's enough because you guys have brought the truth back. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, You're right Jen. here. I'll just be humble to that. Yeah. Yep. That, okay. Yeah. That for me is just yeah. Mm. Jason, what did you feel about? Um, for me, not to get too hung up on what I can and can't see in the world. It's it's actually what's going on inside of me. That's yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose. I suppose I can feel what Luli's saying as well because I read it and I went, yeah, well, 100 years have passed and because I have this burning desire for truth to be evident on the planet, I also felt about that like, wow, where is it, you know? Is it something that we're always just going to, you know, dream for and hope for and it's never going to eventuate, you know? And that's feelings that, you know... Uh, Barbara, that you were just expressing, really, you know. Um, but I do feel that there's evidence that there is a way that's being created. But it's interesting that I even used the word evidence uh, when responding to you, Luli, because I know that's, a, that's an emotion coming up for you at the moment, like where's the evidence, how can we measure it, how can it be, um, how can it be proven? I, the truth is I feel it will be proven in the future, but patience is required. I didn't think I wanted proof, necessarily. Maybe I did. Um, but well, you, you want evidence of it, don't you? Well, they're talking about it, and I'm just wondering what it is. What, what are they talking What about? they're referring to. Men are beginning to appreciate that natural food is prepared in heaven or at the end. Where Page do you 97, when they talk about um, the wondrous leaven. Like... Um, Oh, yeah. The work progress. is slow in its progress and difficult to prosecute, but li the little which has already been accomplished is working with a wondrous leaven and truth being powerful to the pulling down of strongholds of error. It's so mu it must so continue until the gloom of ignorance is driven away. If you think about the reformations that happened in the church, like how have churches on the planet changed in the last hundred years? You know, there's a lot of things that have, that have altered in terms of society's tolerance towards other other races, diff people who are different, people who are, are termed as insane, crazy, you know, I feel that that's what that's what that's the leaven we can see, you know. There's more compassion practiced commonly. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah. Alex. Yeah, that's what I'm getting really strongly is um, the changes in society like communism, apartheid women's rights, um, all the e equality, all of these things that have, that have changed through generations and through this, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all this prohibition. There's been like endless amount of things that have changed and, yeah. and, and we can just see if we look back and through history in that 100 years and of how much has it actually changed yeah. and how much better it is for each generation coming through. Yeah. And we think we had it tough but our parents had it pretty tough and I've... You know, I talk to my granddad often and, and like he had a really bad, you know, yeah. and I'd hate to think how what it was like for the generation even before that. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that the issue is now we can now that we're learning about what love really is, we can see, well, there's a lot of error. But it's easy to forget how how really bad things were in terms of fear, control, um, justification of brutality yeah okay if we go to Renee and Jason and we can go to all of you just put your hands up again so I'm just yeah. sort of getting a feeling that maybe on the flip side that it, it's not as well because on another level there was 
It was, sure, it was really bad and the fear and uh, the control and how hard it was back in many centuries ago. But it's still somewhere, to me, feels like it's here still, quite a depth, but it's under, it's just gone un covert. Like, it's still being... And, and the way well, to find it, what I was feeling, is that we will only know through how we feel within ourselves, And then how we feel within ourselves, then we will feel like as we're growing in our soul, that we will then feel like, it's like looking, it's like looking inside, it's like um, cleaning up our own backyard and looking out, like reflecting, of course, and um, I don't know what I'm trying to say now, but I'm just... <laughs> well, I think there's two things you're saying. We can take responsibility for what's inside of our soul right now, and that's the most loving thing we can do. Mm. But I feel that really when you're saying things have kind of gone underground, I actually feel that there's been a rebellion now that has occurred. There was a lot of control and oppression and now there's a lot of rebellion that is, especially in the West, that has actually caused a lot of soul damage. It's caused people to act in very immoral ways around, lo like um, Alan was talking about in the 60s, you know. Everyone just went, yep, yeah, let's go to bed with everyone. And that's actually hurt a lot of people. Um, but that was a rebellion against the oppression and the judgment and the shame of about sexuality. Now, it's true, those wounds are not healed, but they're a little bit more out in the open. <laughs> you know, it's not as oppressor, oppressy, abuser, abusee, although that still occurs in very many places. There have been shifts, I feel, in terms of how the power struggle is, like, shaken up and... There, there's an opportunity, there's a window now, I feel, a doorway for us to really heal. I don't feel true healing of the shame, for example, has happened, but there has been a changing in how the oppression happens. Do I, you, I yeah. suppose it's been exposed more. Yep. Like it's come to the surface on yep. one level, but it's still... Yep. Um, it, it's like powered up where it's been pushed out to where this generation has to really take re personal responsibility or... <laughs> end of the world, I suppose. <laughs> well, That's yeah. The feeling. Like. Yeah, there's a lot of accumulated damage within a lot of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason was next, yeah. I, I think to get a really good reference point of the change in the world is, I know looking at myself, if I was just, just sometimes I, I feel like I haven't progressed at all, but if I was to really stop and look and feel back at to where I have been and yeah. what I used to demonstrate in my life to where I am now, it's it's... It's, it's three, four, five realities different. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's like gives you hope back that yeah. yeah you are changing and you are contributing to the change on the planet. Even yeah. though sometimes you look at the news and go, oh wow, you know, it's pretty depressing. Yeah, and I think the the key is to be humble to all of that. You know, to be humble to how I have changed, how I'm still yet to change. Be humble to what looking at the news brings up. Be humble to... Every, if we just can embrace everything, uh, like emotionally, then then we really can heal, yeah. And it's not to, yeah, get too caught up in the, the ins and outs of it. So if we go to Barbara, then Suzanne. And did you have your hand up, Lorleen? Yeah, if we go to Suzanne uh, after Barbara, then we'll go. Um, going back to Luli's comment... Um, I see evidence of change because your next trip is evidence of change. You wouldn't be going to Mexico and Brazil if they didn't have a desire for truth. Um, and there's people putting their hand up wanting truth more yeah. and more than what there ever was before. Yeah. So there is a desire that's growing. Yeah. So I see yeah. that um, happening. Yeah. yeah. And I see change in you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, that was a bad addiction there for Deb. <laughs> I love you, Deb. I know. I know that feeling where you just go, have I even changed? Well, it's funny you say that because when you were just talking and with Renee just then, I was thinking to myself, wow, Mary's really growing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, I've changed too. <laughs> All right, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, I, my sense is that things are changing phenomenally. Mm. I just feel so encouraged. You know, I always say you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs and, and I think revolution's like that too. Yep. It's messy and it does start with things like the 60s and 
but then there's all the people who just won't accept what the church wants to tell them anymore. Yep. And, and to my mind, even the whole New Age movement and all the crazy things are people looking everywhere, like they're ripping up the carpets they want an <laughs> yeah. answer. Yeah. And even if yeah. they get the wrong answers, I think like a hundred years is a nano yeah. for what could the potential that's there now. Yeah, and I think, I think that as well. I, as I work through more injuries, I have more patience <laughs> and more understanding of how eternal things are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Lorraine, did you? I, I think you answered it before about the soul condition, but I, I was a little confused when, when you talked one time and AJ confirmed that the state of the world today, I understood, was worse than... Morally worse. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Which has a big impact on soul condition. Yeah. Yeah. But really, I think when they're talking about the leaven, they're talking about the truth that's been dropped upon the earth. And if you think about, there has been truths that have been dropped upon the earth that have, some of them have taken hold. And uh, in our society now, uh, it doesn't mean we're morally any better <laughs> because we we've, we've, haven't healed some of those things that were, you know, when we were oppressed... And we still feel angry, we still don't want to feel our shame, we still want to live in fear, all these things that were created through other people treating us in error. So, and, and when we act in rebellion to those things, we often act very immorally and that affects our soul condition. But there is truth that, that has taken hold on, on the planet. So it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because there's a lot of aspects to it. We think, okay, well, right, well... Yep, truth on the planet, so we should all be looking happy and wandering around. And but there's a, there's a lot to this growth towards God. And um, <laughs> is that an understatement of the century? But <laughs> well, it's very simple, really. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> I've got a question about the the um, the tens and you know units, be tens, and then hundreds and thousands. Mm -hmm. So the armies will grow and be officered from the hosts of heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, is he talking about armies of mediums, like lots and lots of mediums bringing the truth, or what's... I think he's talking about just people in truth. I'm just trying to find where... Do you have a... It's right, right near the end. The yeah. last line. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got a question from email about this as well that we might talk about as well. Um... The units of the followers are steady and multiplying. Yeah, no, he, I think he's talking about truth carriers, people in truth. People who love, and love truth. And, people yeah. who love truth, yeah. So not just about mediums. Which probably leads me to a question that I got via email from Elvira. Um, it brought up a lot of feelings for her in this last paragraph. Um, she says, what does the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ mean? Which is... The, one of the last, last sentences. She says, That sentence is exposing what I'm sure is a dozen unloving layers I can't see yet and taps into something I have mentioned before. Does his Christ mean Jesus? Because to me that puts Jesus in a separate category from the rest of us. It has always felt like that to me. In all of Earth's history, only one person had exercised his will to become at one with God on Earth. It had taken that one person to come back to earth to make it possible again. Why? AJ talks about the attributes, a passion for God, inquisitiveness, etc., which led him to being at one with God in the first century. It feels to me he was able to do that because God gave him those attributes, those, those passions, those personality traits in a unique way. Even having enough desire seems to me to be something that God gave Jesus in a unique way. Otherwise, he would not be only one out of billions of people through history to be at one with God on earth. I can already hear you saying how much anger there is in what I'm saying. <laughs> good, good save, Elvira. Um, <laughs> but I feel like I need to expose what I really feel if I'm going to get anywhere. This question also goes, a lot, goes to a lot of my struggles with God. So my question to you guys is, well, who, who relates to those feelings? A few of you, yeah. Who has ideas on what Elvira said? What, what do you think? Any, any response? Well, how would you respond to her, Ange? 
and then we'll go to Di. Um, I don't know, I just sort of had the thought, well, who cares if, <laughs> if he was made a little bit different or a little bit special or a little bit, like, thank God, somebody was. <laughs> okay, so there's one thing. Uh, Elvira is seeing this as a, like a, almost a slight yeah, against yeah, her yeah. when I see it as an amazing gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that uh, um, very pu- few people understand is that when someone walks the way ahead of you, the way is built. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. who's, ever, who's, ever cut a, who's ever cut a path through the yep. bush? Yep. It yep. is hard yep. work. Yep. You yep. get scratched up yep. and bloody and, it ta- you know, it's tough labour, isn't it? Uh, and, so when, and then when you come along behind them, it's not that bad. You might get a few scratches here and there, but if you're the 50th person through, it's all, it's all worn down and, and the way is clearer. This is true emotionally for your soul growth. When, when someone goes ahead of you and deals with an emotion, it is like metaphysically, spiritually, whatever you want to say, it is easier for you to go through that emotion. So when someone's already gone all the way to God ahead of you, that is an incredible gift. So that's one thing, yeah. What, what else? In, uh, Ger- oh, sorry, die and then Geraldine. I guess for me when he talks about our Lord and his Christ, um, it is that Jesus was the first to do that, but it's um, that God wants that for every one of us. Yeah. To become Christed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So in answer to your question, it is referring to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, because that was Barb's question as well. But it's not... It's, it's it, bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. It's the opportunity that... That Jesus has created for us too mm. in that service. And really, didn't God give everyone that opportunity? Yeah. 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 So what do you think about Elvira saying, but what about the passions and desires put into our soul? How would you respond to that? Geraldine, do you want to? I seem to remember whether it was AJ that actually said this. I think it was that... Um, We've each had specific qualities and desires built into our souls, and just like, and, and that each of us has something unique, mm-hmm. and that his um, a- AJ's very specific um, gift or desire is his relationship with God. That that that's very specific to him, and that his soul was designed as to be the messenger. Of yeah. truth from God, yeah. and that that is his specific. Yeah, if I can just purpose. Yeah, clarify it. You're not far off. Um, so in our soul, his and mine, there is a, a strong feeling for God. There is there are these qualities and attributes about a desire to serve and to have a relationship with God. However, why has he been at one with God and not me? Sandra? Thank you. Um, uh, it feels like um, he does say a lot that his era was quite taken from him when he was very young. So he was always already, he didn't understand everyone. And that was the first thing that went kind of, I could say, wrong for everyone, that he didn't understand people's emotions because he didn't have those errors in him. So as he grew into a grown man, he didn't, he couldn't relate to that and I guess you had you, you know you didn't have that opportunity so that in itself was the one thing that was different I feel mm-hmm. compared to all of us uh, yes and no uh, if we go to Karen yeah. um, it, it, um, it goes with that um, I was wondering just before um, because he didn't have the error because it was cleared from him in birth in the first century and because this time round he did have and he cleared them, does that mean that it's only since 1963 that he that we've had the increased opportunity to follow along the path that he has carved? Like he's carving a different path now than he did before? Um, yes, slightly different. I feel it would be good to have him speak to this because that's his experience. 
Um, the point I was trying to get to is a little less involved than this because it relates to all of you as well in your development. But um, it's an interesting point, Karen. I feel that the way... The thing is, when someone... It's not strictly true because when someone is standing in front of you without an injury, say um, you've, got, you've been very hurt by men in your life, and I'm a woman standing in front of you with no judgment of that injury, but also without that injury within me. It doesn't matter if I had it before in the past, although that will lead me to have more empathy and compassion, or more empathy with you. The, the gift I give you is being able to confront that error within you without judgment and to love you. And I in no way um, agree with, your, with the injury within you, like from a soul perspective. So in that way, I'm showing you another way. Do you see that? So whether I had that injury or not, that openness is there. So in that way, no, he showed the way. Um, but his experience obviously is enriching our soul right now because of he is going through a different one. But do you all agree that he's closer to God than, say, me or you? Yes. Okay. So he didn't have any injury cleared away from him this time. What happened? <laughs> Diana? His humility. Yeah. He's, the mo he's the most humble and he has a love for his brothers and sisters and yep. a love for God. Yes. Yep. If you pass forward to Graham. It seems like AJ is right at the very end of the bell curve. This so so where it gets so thin that there's only just one person there. <laughs> yeah. and, and you're just a bit He's further about back. Jumping up. Oh no, I'm way up there. I'm swimming around with with everyone in the big But it would have been the, the same in the, in the first century too. Yeah, but what what did he do, guys? This is the thing. Elvira's saying God gave him everything and it was just a walk in the park and he got there and I can't do it because it's too hard for me. God didn't give me the same things. What did he do? What has he done now? Uh, Kel? He exercised his desire. Yes. And did he, was he born with this desire? Like, we've got the same soul. He's, he's there and I'm here yep. on the bell curve. So what did he do? He was, well, he was humble to feel the fullness of his desire. Yes. He rode the bell curve of desire. Different bell curve analogy, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> and he developed his desire. He's had to work on that desire. You know, when, yeah. you, when you're at the front line working on that desire, it's not that easy, you know. Everyone around you is going, that's ridiculous, what are you on about, we should commit you, all of that kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of humility and perseverance, commitment to that desire. So that's the thing that I think Elvira is missing, that all of us have that opportunity to develop our desire to grow towards God. God didn't just say, because can you see that God wants us to know ourselves and develop our souls? And if he just went, here you go, here's a ticket. You'll be at one with God next week. And we didn't have to do anything. We just skipped over the greatest truth of the universe, which is we can have a personal relationship with God that's interactive, that's giving and receiving on both ends. So, um, which is good news, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that... You know, he's had to come to the party in this relationship. And I'm still deciding if I want to be this God's messenger of truth on earth, as the feminine aspect of it. That's a big deal, you know, and that's why he's there and I'm up here grappling around in the fear of it, you know. Yeah. Joy? Um, Mary, um, Jesus has given us a number of talks over the last month or so um, which indicate as well as his desire, he has a very logical, systematic approach, which he's encouraging us to do too, to use our mind as God intended it, with more of a scientific um, attitude really, and try it out and, and so on. He's, he's, he's just outstanding at that. Like, yes. He's just the most amazing role model. And Perhaps he's the, the world's most authentic scientist. Do you yes, think? Yeah. I, th I think <laughs> so. Experimenter. I yeah. think so. Yeah. It just blows me away. So he doesn't... He, I think if I look contrast at my own errors, I've relied so much on just something I've been told or my own opinion from past experience and all of those things which are meaningless really, yeah. whereas he has always just sought the truth and started off from a premise of, well, if I'm loving and, and I like to know the truth and I'm clever, well, then God's just that much more than I am. 
So why, I, want to, I want to seek God because I want to learn all this from him so he must be way more loving and know way more truth than I do. So it's the way he's searched yeah. as well as having the desire. Which is really, if you think about it, humble. He's just Very. the epitome of humility. Yeah. So, but that's also something he's had to develop and that's also something we all have to develop if we want to be at one with God. So it's not really that there's been a special ticket with his name on. It's just that he has he's exercised his will in harmony with the gifts that God has given. And as Geraldine points out, everyone's been given gifts. And don't think that God plays favourites on who he wants a relationship with. He wants it equally with all of us. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually something added to all of us that he would create a soul or a group of souls who are really like attuned just to that to that possibility but they still have to you know they still have to develop that desire within themselves and if you if you look even if the difference between myself and AJ or uh, myself and AJ and others as a 14 or you know all we all have these souls that are just like pretty attuned to God and service but how it's how humble we want to be and how much we want to exercise our desire and it's the same goes for you guys and same goes for my beautiful sister Elvira she's just feeling she's resisting some feelings of hopelessness a feeling that you know this is really hard God and I don't know if I'm up to it yeah yeah okay Jen at the back um I felt that in the last line that where um, the kingdom of the Lord and his Christ, I felt that that was like a metaphor, a metaphor for truth because the rest of the, rest of the content of the chatter, chapter talks heavily about truth mm-hmm. and I felt in this case that it was not only a, um, like a personal reference towards uh, Jesus and at one moment but it was also a metaphor for the message um, that's brought, that's been brought to the planet um, by Jesus of truth from God? Well, if you think about it, uh, he's saying that um, when the two worlds will be united, so he's talking about the spirit world and the earth, in an, you know, there's going to be this new establishment. And if you consider if this truth was united between the spirit world and here, then it wouldn't just be a metaphor, it would be a literal thing, wouldn't it? So I see what you're saying, but it's kind of... It's a beautiful way of saying something that's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yep, more hands. That's fine. Suzanne, and then we'll go to Deb. Sorry, Jennifer, I missed you over there. This is just moving away from the subject, but it keeps coming to me. Yep. I just wonder if Fred's here. You know, he totally is. It's been a real... I've been having this really interesting uh, thing with... (coughs) my mediumship lately where I, I went into a lot of fear about a lot of things and I've been really blocking it. And um, sometimes, in, in re- I haven't recently, but in past weeks I've come to AJ and I've said, babe, this thing here, what is this all about, you know? And I get in my fear. I talked about that last week in the group down south. And he'd say, well, just ask Fred yourself. Like, you're a medium. He knows the answer. He'll tell you exactly what he meant. And um, I've been like, oh, no, I can't, no, I can't get it wrong. I don't want to talk to Fred. It's all too, too much. And anyway, uh, I kind of had some realisations about some emotions. I had a good chat with AJ about mediumship on the way driving back here. And ev- in the last two days, I was just Fred's everywhere. He's like, he's, you know, after, he's like, yep. Because he, at the end of last week, Igor said to me, so, Mary the end of the book, we channel in Fred, are you going to do that? And I went, oh, good idea, Igor. And then, then he was like, yep, we're doing that. Oh, <laughs> so wow. if we make it to chapter 21 or 22, <laughs> we might do it before, but Fred would like, he's definitely here. Yeah, yeah I feel him today. Yeah, which is pretty exciting, hey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I think... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who else had their hand up? There's one last thing I wanted to cover with you guys before we finish, but let's go to Jennifer. And Sorry, Deb, you had it. Go Deb and then Jen. Yep. Oh, I just wanted to make um, a comment on the earlier thing we were talking about with the time and the no hurry in the spirit world. And yep. um, and the word came was great, graciousness mm-hmm. and grace. Yeah. And, um, 
I kind of thought it was huge because I've been in a hurry most of my life and not had that, had grace. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm relieved that that's the way. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. And actually that's, one of, that's the thing I wanted to talk about. So let's talk about it now before we go to Jen. On page 97, uh, Krishna says to him, whenever you are ready, the opportunity will not, will not be wanting for you to begin. So Fred's just expressed this huge desire, can I please, you know, I want to tell the truth. And Krishna said, you know, hang on, hold fire, you need to learn a few things. And he's gone, okay, all right. And he said, when you're ready, like, there will be an opportunity. And this is, the, this is one of the things I wanted to leave you with about this beautiful thing that I feel God's showing me about desire lately. And it's, it's there in the, in the chapters. And it's about how if I just experience my desire... If I'm just humble to my desire and I let that emotional experience even purify my desire just through, if, if you think about it, if you really allow the experience emotionally of what you want, any fear you have around it immediately gets triggered. But also you can kind of feel if it's a bit icky as well, can't you? you a lot of times you can. You know, you can, it, it's, often we shut it down and act it out because we don't want to feel the ickiness of when it's out of harmony with love. Or when it's in harmony with love, we don't want to feel those terrible feelings that Fred felt of like, please tell me, it's, please tell me I can do it. I can't bear it if I can't do it, you know. So this, this experience of allowing desire really opens us up emotionally to everything, I feel. All of the error, all of the fear and all of the beauty inside of us. And what I really felt, with what Kushner was showing to Fred there is if we are just humble to desire and we're humble to God's way of the universe acting, then God will present the opportunity for our desire to be fulfilled when it's the right time and in the, right, in the way that he deems us to be ready. Now, my experience of that is I go, yeah, I'd love to, I think I'm going to do a book group with 12 people in our living room <laughs> and then 65 of you turn up and I go, okay, God obviously thinks I'm ready for 65 people. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I followed my desire and this is what came. I'll have to trust God on this one because I feel pretty insignificant, you know. And that was the, that was the beautiful thing. I, said, I wrote in my journal, um, there's an interplay between desire and God and patience requires humility or it's enabled by humility and God sees the best time and we only have to be ready to respond when he presents the opportunity so this idea of like having to force through the fear and make the desire happen it's a lack of humility isn't it you know if we just we will act when the when the when the opportunity is brought to us you know we don't have to push it to happen we don't have to be passive we just have to be ready to respond and humble to the feelings that are going on so that that what else did I write we must simply allow our own emotions and integrity to refine us until the point that we attract what it is we desire and that way we'll be more in harmony with love so that's just something that's been really powerful in my life and in the last little while, like God's real, I'm really seeing that shown to me everywhere. And when we were in Kyabra, there was beautiful examples of people following their desire with music and, and just really going with the opportunities that God presented and not trying to control how it came about, just going, okay, this is what we're doing, <laughs> you know. And then there's times when we want to control how it comes about because it scares us or we think whatever, yeah, but my feeling at the moment is what I'm really praying about is just allowing this desire to, to overwhelm me and let God show me what I'm ready for and where the error is, yeah. Mm. So I probably wanted to leave you with that, but I know Jen had her hand up for ages, so I just want to go to you. <laughs> okay, thanks, yeah, thanks Mary. Mm. Um, this relates to what we were talking about with the soul of yours and, and AJ's. Yeah. Um, and it might just be exposing an error in my mm-hmm. own self. Um, but the question is, is a quality like leadership, have, does that have anything to do with masculine feminine, like the way the soul splits? Uh, no, not really. 
but obviously there has been there's a lot of injury on the planet around um, femininity and a resistance to leadership in femininity. Yeah, but no, I feel femininity leads just as strongly as masculinity. Yeah, it's just that um, I feel there's a lot of judgment in most women against what is their true feminine nature and that prevents them actually expressing it, uh, myself included. Um, and so <clears throat> that's why we don't see... We see women trying to lead in a very forceful way uh, in order to... <coughs> I'm obviously very emotional about this topic, yeah, in order to get over the feelings that they have about their own femininity, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was the best place to leave it. <laughs> yeah. That's something that I'm really looking at inside myself as well. What is femininity and um, the beauty in it that I have rege I've been rejecting for a long time. So. Yeah. <laughs> what was that, Karen? Can't wait. <laughs> Don't wait for me. <laughs> Go for it yourselves. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. That um, I enjoyed that discussion with you all. Thank you for being part of it. Yeah. <laughs> One last thing that that speaks to mediumship and prayer. As you know, we're about to head off in a couple of days and we're going to go, we're heading to Sweden, uh, yep, Sweden, London, the USA, Barbados and Brazil. It is, it is exciting, isn't it? And I'm sort of feeling the joy of just sharing this truth with people. Um, but in Brazil, I don't know if you guys know much about Brazil, but there's a lot of um, spirit, spiritist, spiritual, there's a lot of belief in spirits and mediumship. A lot of people are very gifted mediums. Um, and there's also a very strong emphasis on Catholicism or some other kind of different teachings that involve reincarnation. Uh, because of that, I don't know if you guys know, there's a man there called Denny who's been travelling around and sharing the divine truth with people, which is pretty awesomely brave if you think about standing up in front of a bunch of people telling them that Jesus and Mary Magdalene are back and this is, this is the truth about reincarnation. Uh, I don't know if he does it exactly like that, but <laughs> there's, there's been some hang-ups about this idea of reincarnation and there's a lot of spirit control over how open people are to new beliefs, to having their beliefs challenged. So I just thought um, to ask you guys, if you have the desire, to just pray for the people, uh, the spirits and the people in Brazil to just be open to, to new truth and to new learning. If you would like to offer your prayers for them, that would be really welcomed. Uh, yeah, yeah. So thanks for that. Mm. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I don't know if we'll get it. I'll get to do a book group with people while we're away. Everyone's a bit spread out. But if it happens, I think that'll be fun. So you get to meet them. If not, I'll see you for chapter nine in about seven weeks. <laughs> I hope. It, is it getting a bit difficult to stay in the flow? Or no? uh, You can always go back and just... Yeah, yeah. It's a good chapter, Jealousy. Very juicy one. Yeah, big. We'll probably need a few sessions. Yeah, yeah. Nine weeks. Nine weeks to read it. Read it every day for nine weeks and <laughs> you can run the session when I get back. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, you guys. Yeah, and uh, yep. Can't wait to see how much you've all grown in seven weeks. Thank <laughs> you.